Coming up on One Detroit, Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist David Turnley on the last assignment during COVID-19 for his U of M students. Plus the future of Shane Park and outdoor venues just like it. Also coming up, I'll meet up with jazz musician Joan Belgrave. And then president of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra and Parsons on the DSO's future. That plus a hopeful tribute to Detroit. I'm Christy McDonald. Join me. One Detroit is coming up. Support for this program provided by W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan, dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. And thank you to these supporters and viewers like you. Hi there, and welcome to One Detroit. I'm Christy McDonald. It is all about arts and culture on this episode and the impact of COVID-19. I really love doing these shows with interviews from my home, as well as interviews that are on WRCJ and American Black Journal. We're also bringing you performances in this unprecedented time. So coming up on One Detroit, I meet up with Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist David Turnley. Not only was he behind the lens of some of our generation's most iconic pictures, he's teaching a new generation of documentarians at the University of Michigan. It is the power of pictures in the days of COVID-19. Plus, Stephen Henderson checks in on the latest at Shane Park in Detroit. Also coming up, jazz great Joan Belgrave. And you'll hear from DSO President Ann Parsons, and then some hope for Detroit with a little help from Jeff Daniels and Big Sean. It is all coming up. We live in a video world, but the power of still photography cannot be ignored, especially in this time. And joining me now to talk a little bit about that is David Turnley. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist and a documentarian, and he's also a professor at the University of Michigan. David, it's good to see you. Great to see you, Chrissy. Thank you. You've covered so many things around the world and so many iconic images as well. As you look at what's happening in this COVID-19 space that we're living in right now, what runs through your mind as a photojournalist? Well, the first thing is just, you know, I've spent my life really as a documentary photographer covering world events. Um, and there really isn't a war uh, since the end of the Vietnam War that I haven't covered. Um, and I think the first thing that I just have to say is that this is, while a different kind of war, this is really a world war. Um, the enemy is very elusive, but the impact, as we know, is just beyond anything that any of us have our, of this time period, of any of our generations have, have really experienced. Um, so the, the fact that it has such a global impact um, and is so incredibly relevant in all of our lives, of course, is something that as documentary photographers we respond to. And you're teaching a class at the University of Michigan when everything changed for the students. Um, so you had to change as well. What did you tell them to start doing once they had to, had to go home? Yeah, one of the realities of being a photojournalist is you're always having to think ahead. Um, so very quickly, I thought, oh my gosh, what an incredible opportunity. They won't be able to go outside of their homes to photograph people that they may not know, but they have the opportunity to photograph themselves and their families. And I had 26 students from an incredible diverse socioeconomic, geographical um, range across America. Send me 12 pictures a week for five weeks and document this memorable time of your lives. And I had 26 students who just really embraced this. And, um, and then I curated from that um, 10 photographs from each of them to some amazing music um, that's really quite moving. And it's, an, it's a really unique opportunity to see 
families' lives in the midst of this pandemic across this country, the everyday lives. What did you find in some of these photos? And was there an intimacy there that was initially maybe difficult for some of these students to, to turn in on themselves and their own lives? It's interesting because they're sort of 18 to 25 years old. And to use this period of their lives to actually, you know, step back and almost think to themselves, like, who are these people that happen to be my family? And to, and to interact with them as they normally would, but to really try to see them. And as I was getting the photographs coming in, I was seeing this sort of look in the eye. So two things sort of happen that I've witnessed, and people tend to sort of sit down because they need to be grounded. So you sort of see a lot of that. You sort of see people close to the ground, sitting on chairs in couches. You see hugging of pets. Um, and then you start to see this look in the eye. And it's a kind of a stare. It's a, sort, it's a stare we see all the time in war zones. And it is that sense of absolutely the unknown. They actually, almost in a Buddhist sense, started to embrace the opportunity rather than to sort of spend their time reflecting on the experience to actually experience it with their camera and they started to do that and you started to see all kinds of things going on um, from really sort of uh, reckoning with who their family members are how they were going to spend their time how people respond to this kind of adversity um, because it's a whole range of emotions would you say that having this experience for them may have forever changed the kind of photojournalists or photographers that they wanted to be had you had never had this, I guess, disruption in, in history, really? Oh, I absolutely think so. I mean, for all of us, I think it was one of those great moments where it was just the, the coming together of the constellation, so to speak, um, to deploy this tool um, with an understanding of how power it can be both to reflect an individual's experience, but to resonate universally for all of us. So Shakita Masi, the president and CEO of the Aretha, welcome. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's, it's great. To be here. It's really great to have you here with us. Um, uh, let's start with uh, you talking about the effect of this pandemic and all of the disruption on entertainment venues like the Aretha. Obviously, you're shut down like uh, everybody else, but but talk about the the threat of long term disruption. Uh, just how you've been managing all of this. Um. The virus has disrupted our day-to-day -day business, obviously. You know, Detroit is, um, is, is a hard place sometimes in the wintertime. And we look forward to getting outside in the summer when the weather breaks and the day that the tickets go on sale at the Aretha, people are just gleeful that, you know, summer's here and we can actually go and do something that's, that's, that's fun, that's nourishing to our spirits. And to have that kind of taken away has really um, impacted not only, you know, the thousands of people that attend every year, but our staff as well as, and then of course our, our business. But um, small businesses, independent businesses are particularly hard hit. We are not publicly traded. We are not multinational corporations. We are a business as are several other uh, concert venues, music venues in our, our area, uh, independently owned and operated. We're a family owned business. So this hits us particularly hard. Um, it hits us hard as a family. It hits the 300 plus people that work for us every summer. Um, we are an economic engine on the riverfront of Detroit. Over 300 people work there regularly all summer long. And, and now that's not happening. Um, so we're working to, to identify mitigation strategies so that we can open safely and uh, provide an environment where people feel comfortable coming to enjoy music on the river again. I wonder if you can talk just a little about um, uh, 
what you think is probable or possible for concert venues uh, in, in, in the future. I'll begin by saying that um, some surveys have begun to happen and people are reporting that um, approximately 40% of the audience says that, that they would, they're ready to go back to concerts, that they want to go back to concerts. Um, the, uh, that would, and would do so before a vaccine is, is available. Um, I think that number will grow as people begin to um, be educated about how we can socially distance and improve the sanitation within the various venues. Um, there are people all across the country and our, our staff included that are working to find specific strategies of how we can do this together. Will you stand six, six feet away from somebody while you're, while you're walking to get into a venue? Yeah, okay, I can do that. I'm doing that at the, at the grocery store anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can do this. Um, would you wear a mask? Yeah, <laughs> I probably would. And you know, we've seen all the cool masks that go with the cool outfits and all of that, right? Would you allow your seat to be different than the one that you purchased already. Mm. I don't know about that. Yeah. Um, but that's part of what we've got to work out, right? If we've sold Jeezy and TI and half the house is sold already, can I reseat you to facilitate social distancing without major problems? Um, I, hope so. I hope so. But I think that as we work together, we can do this. And then I looked at, at um, the New York Times today, and I was reading about what happened with music after, during and after the 1918 mm. pandemic. Mm. And it was encouraging to me because people did go back to the theaters and they, and they, they saw a resurgence because people need music. It's, it's, uh, it, it's healing. It's, it's uh, uplifting. It's, it's how we, it, you know, find joy in moments together. I know um, people have seen you perform internationally, of course, at Baker's here in Detroit and Cliff Bells, and also performing with your late husband, Marcus Belgrave. Um, but my joy in being able to do these shows or we're devoting it to arts and culture in this time of COVID-19 is really being able to, to, you know, get to know people a little bit better and see how you're doing with everything. Well, there's positives and there's negatives. I mean, it, obviously um, the gigs for this year, are gone. I've been fortunate that, um, you know, my gigs have been rescheduled till 2021, but there's a lot of people who, who are not, you know, able to say that. The, the one thing that I must say, um, uh, I've had more, like with my family, my immediate family, my children, and we get to do these little weekly Zoom things because everybody's home. Um, also, one of the things that I've that I've been doing is checking in on um, on our older musicians, you know, our jazz legends, and and making sure they're okay. I want to believe that we will get back to some some sense of normalcy, but this virus is deadly. Uh, we have to take it seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Joan, have you had personal loss? Absolutely, yeah. And um, I'm sorry. you know when I see people who are not taking it seriously or people who are saying, oh, you know, our rights are being violated because we're being made to stay home. I'm like, you might be okay, but you're gonna transmit it to somebody that I love. And, and having lost someone that I love, many people that it's just, it's ridiculous. Stay home, you know, it's not, nothing is that serious that it's worth your life. People talk about being able to go out and make, get back to work and make money. What good is it going to do if you're, in, you're six feet under? What good is that going to do if you're not here to, um, to see your family and to hug your children? I can't wait to get back to a time when I can hug my grandbabies. I wrote this song called, uh, I'm Not Going Anywhere. It's, 
help me understand that those that we love are going to be with us no matter what. That's the only way that I can deal with it because I know now I'm not going anywhere. I'm here. There's no need for you to doubt. Don't fear. I know your heart is full of pain and you're tired of the rain. There is something you should know. I will always love you so. There is so much more we have to do. And our love will see us through. Cause I'm not going anywhere. No, I'm not going anywhere. It, it helps me to remember that, you know, especially during this time. It, it took me a year to even be able to breathe once Marcus passed, you know? I mean, I couldn't, I, I basically couldn't function, you know? I mean, um, because I loved him so much. People don't know the circumstances of his passing. He took a gig um, in, um, at this college, traditionally black, uh, historically black college down South, and I, I couldn't go with him because I had another gig booked and I always went with him to make sure everything was okay and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and I said hey please don't take it I can't go no they need me they need me I'm like okay so anyway as a result of that that's what put him into the hospital and that's what and I was really angry you know I'm like you know you didn't have to do that but then it, I realized it was so important to him to give to those students that if it meant his life that was something he was willing to sacrifice. Um, but it took me a while to get there, you know, and, th and that's when I wrote that song. And I think that um, that has helped me during this time. It's different because it's not by choice. It's a collective grief though. That's what you're tapping into. And, and having had to move through that, yeah, you're equipped in a different way. Right. People. And I, I think that there's something beautiful about, you know, your song and what you really your roots in singing in the church choir um, and that informing the song choices and, and the way that you're able to absolutely, I think, I think, deal with grief through music. Music brings people together. I sing jazz. I sing blues. I sing funk. One of the things that that I learned through jazz is that music is just conversation. And if you can have a conversation musically with the band, with the audience, then you're, you've done what, what your purpose is. We need to open the lines up, communication, reach out to people and say, it's going to be all right. You know, I know it's tough right now. You know, it's tough for all of us. But you know what? The alternative is not being here. Okay? So do whatever it is that you need to do, you know, because I want to see you on the other side. The season's coming. Go! The Detroit Symphony Orchestra is working through this transition during COVID-19 by engaging listeners online and through social media. But President Ann Parsons is also looking ahead. She talked with WRCJ's Peter Worf. Ann Parsons is president and CEO of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. We're talking to her today about how the orchestra has been and is and is planning to respond to the coronavirus crisis. We've seen things like your cello section getting together to team up with the Bach cello suites. Uh, tell viewers about that. Well, um, our musicians uh, started this idea of play on your porch. And then the cello section said, let's, let's do something fun. Let's take the piece of music and divide it up into sections. Usually we play as a section. Uh, in this case, the section is going to make a tribute gift to the community by each playing um, their own part of it, and then we wove it together, and so it is um, presented as a piece of music. It's a, it's a great opportunity to showcase our fantastically gifted musicians. You hear the cello section most of the time um, as a whole, and so um, this is an opportunity to hear each one of them line for line. Uh, and exposed and in their homes. And um, it's really, it's, it's quite special. Tell me about maybe some of the other conversations you might be having with your counterparts at other music presenting organizations or cultural organizations around Detroit or around Michigan. 
I remember thinking um, that night we were making this decision to send people home. I wonder what anyone else is doing <laughs> and um, how should we act as a sector together? And I called Wayne Brown and um, soon I was talking with Patricia Meridian at the Henry Ford. Wayne, of course, is at Michigan Opera Theater. Mich and Wayne had a, an enormous program um, that he was about to launch. I, of course, I was on the phone with Matthew Van Beesen from uh, University Musical Society and his chorus was part of our Carmina uh, production. So we were all in conversation about what was the right thing to do, um, how to do that, and um, how to communicate um, consistent messaging to um, not only our sector, our patrons, but to our employees. What are you thinking about the coming season? We are trying to take this in um, sections, if you will. We know what we don't know which is when will we be able to perform um, as an orchestra on stage in a closed setting um, or as an orchestra in an outdoor setting? So the, the, the first question will be, can we perform outdoors this summer? I think that's the first opportunity before us. I think there are pl plenty of um, ways that we could take advantage of the summer months in ways that we have before and in ways we have not. So we are looking at all that and holding our options open. Sure. We are counting on a fall season. And right now that is our plan and our hope. It's, it's still early days. And I think we'll just uh, be waiting for the, um, the medical advisors and science uh, people to say what is ultimately safe for everyone to do. You've made a lot available online, so many performances from Orchestra Hall from this past season and recent season. So at least uh, we can virtually experience concerts with the DSO. We've had fun with that because our musicians um, are always on stage when we're web streaming our concerts. And so they have not had the opportunity to engage the way they are now doing. Um, they're introducing the concerts. They're uh, answering questions um, in chat spaces. Uh, calling attention to things. Uh, it's, it's really fun for them and as well as us and, and fun for our community to get to know the personalities of our individual musicians um, as, they, as they engage in this way. And finally tonight, a tribute to Hope and the city of Detroit. This video has been making the rounds on social media. It was made by three filmmakers from Michigan, David Zeman, Adam Luger, and Scott Gordon. You'll recognize the voices in the video, actor Jeff Daniels and rapper Big Sean. Oftentimes it's not what you look at that matters. It's what you see. You see a city halted in its tracks. See his fighting spirit preparing to roar back. You see empty public venues. Quiet displays of heroism. But there is always hope. Yes, we are sheltered in place. But we don't waste our days idly watching the clock. Instead, we do what time does. We keep moving. We keep going. We keep our spirit alive. After all, a motor city knows better than anywhere. Difficult roads often lead to beautiful destinations. And that is going to do it for One Detroit. Thanks so much for joining us. For all of our stories and daily updates, just go to our website at onedetroitpbs.org. All right, so let's leave you tonight with a little bit of jazz and a performance from Adonis Rose and Peace of Mind performing at the Blue Llama Jazz Club. I'll see you soon. Take care.
You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter. Support for this program provided by W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. And thank you to these supporters. And viewers like you.